Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. Monty Python. Hello again and welcome back. Let's continue our journey with the valiant Hidalgo and his calculating squire. Notice how beautifully Cervantes manages to weave into his pastoral parody the same north-south problem that he so often weaves into his chivalric parody. At the end of his list of musical instruments for their new pastoral lifestyle, Don Quixote adds a Moorish instrument. He explicitly notes that this is awkward, but in accord with Cervantes' pro-Morisco attitude throughout the novel, the Hidalgo delights in the mixture. Well, and what if among all this musical variety we hear the sounds of the albogues? Then we would have almost all the pastoral instruments. Hilariously, Sancho is perplexed by this last detail. What are albogues, he asks. Don Quixote describes a multi-tubed flute-like instrument as problematic but still most acceptable accompaniment for the other instruments. It makes a sound which, if not completely agreeable and somewhat dissonant, does not cause displeasure and goes well with the rustic sounds of the bagpipes and the tambourines. This is clearly a metaphor for the mixed cultures of Spain, which Cervantes feels should still include the moriscos. Confirming our interpretation, Don Quixote now launches into a long lesson on historical linguistics, which emphasizes the Arabic influence on Spanish. And this word albogues is morisco, as are all those in our Castilian language which begin with al, such as almohaza, curry comb, almorzar, to eat lunch, alombra, carpet, alguacil, sheriff, alucema, lavender, almacen, storehouse, alcancia, money box, and others like them which probably include a few more, and only three words in our language are Moorish and end in E, which are Borcegui, high boot, Zakizami, attic, and Marebedi, the monetary unit. Aleli, wallflower, and Alfaqui, Muslim scholar, as much for their initial Al as for their final E, are known to be Arabic. Remember the important roles played in previous chapters by words like Al-Kathar, Dulcinea's palace, Al-Jofar, Zoraida's seed pearls, al Kabala, the sales tax paid by the pig herder, and Athemila, the supply mule used by certain priests in part one, and the Duke and Duchess in part two. Sancho continues to embrace the pastoral idea. Interestingly, however, he points out that the newly chosen genre also has its dark side, its rape, murder, and death. He does this by hilariously scrambling a number of refrains and literary topics, all in relation to his daughter's provocative role in their pastoral fantasy. It's a marvelous passage. Did you know? Besides Cervantes, Luis de Góngora also makes reference to the albogue in his Fábula de Polifemo y Galatea, 1612. Notice how Sancho does all of the following in rapid succession. First, he recalls the aggressive desires of Grisóstomo or Eugenio. Second, he cites the same anti-imperialistic refrain used by Don Quixote's niece. Third, he refers to Antonio de Guevara's contempt of court and praise of village of 1539. And four, he alludes to Horace's famous Latin phrase about death as the greatest equalizer. My daughter Sanchica will bring us food to our hut, but watch out, she's good looking. And there are shepherds more wicked than naive, and I wouldn't want her to go for wool and come back sheared. And also, love and wayward desire inhabit fields as well as cities and pastoral huts as well as royal palaces. After all this, Sancho strings together a series of refrains that appear to have nothing to do with anything other than his love for refrains. The exchange grows even funnier when Don Quixote again criticizes Sancho's abuse of refrains. No more proverbs, Sancho. But the Hidalgo ends up using proverbs himself, which causes Sancho to point out his hypocrisy. It seems to me that your grace is like what they say, that's the frying pan calling the kettle black. This is all very funny, 
but there is anti-authoritarian, anti-inquisitional, and anti-racist meaning here as well. Sancho has brought up the issue of miscegenation via his concern for his daughter. He has also indicated that there are evil men everywhere. He has used the same quote from Horace that Cervantes used in the first prologue to challenge the artificial nature of social hierarchy. This phrase by Horace, by the way, was popularly translated by one of the most famous victims of the Inquisition, Fray Luis de Leon. Quixotic mission. From what language does the word albo come? A, English, B, German, C, Arabian. Correct answer, C, Arabian. Finally, the last refrain refers to moral hypocrisy and quite possibly racial hypocrisy. How do we know this? Because it all comes on the heels of a lesson about Morisco and Arabic terms in the Spanish language. As if asking us to reconsider the meaning of the last refrain, Don Quixote himself now gives us a definition of the philosophical importance of these short pieces of wisdom. Proverbs, he says, are brief maxims taken from the experience and speculation of our wise ancestors. With this, he says they should rest for the night. Let us retire from the royal highway, a ways, where we will pass the night. With sadness, Sancho recalls the better meals he received from Diego de Miranda, Camacho, and Antonio Moreno, and then goes to sleep. Don Quixote keeps watch. Thank you for joining me in this chapter. Hope you can join me in the next one too. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.